bright and early. Great. The band is here. They were here early this morning. The alarms were off. They are wide awake. And so um, exciting day in God's house. A couple things I just want to bring to your attention. Remember Miss Hazel? She's a longtime member here. Um, she had somebody in her family this past week that passed away. And so just remember her. Also, those who are longtime members here, you may know Matt, Matt Jolliffe. Um, that is Jess's brother, Miss Lulu's son. Um, he was having a procedure this past week, and something happened in the procedure, and the last word I heard is that he is on life support. And so if you could, just remember Matt Jolliffe and that family with all this going on there. If you're a first-time guest, we're glad you're here today, excited to be in God's house. If you're watching online, we're excited you're here. We encourage you guys just to let us know that it's your first time visit. Today is the second Sunday that we are announcing this, so after the second service, we will be taking up these and counting the, or after the second service, we'll be counting these. Out front, you had deacon ballots. We asked you to fill it out, put it in the offering plate. If you're watching online, you can email your deacon nominations to pastor at kinleybaptist.com, pastor at kinleybaptist.com, and after the second service, we will be counting those votes. And so if you want to get a deacon ballot in, today is the day to do that. Well, we talked all the business we need to talk about. We're here to worship God, so let's get down to what it's really all about. So let's pray, and then I'm going to turn it over to Searching for Silas. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would just have your way this morning. God, I was up early this morning calling out to you that you would move on our hearts. God, that we would find the hope we're looking for in you. Because, God, you are the only place at this point that there is hope. God, I pray, God, that you would meet with us today that it would not just be another worship service we attend, that today would be different, that you would continue to move on our hearts and we would grow in our love for you a little more. God, we pray for those who have experienced loss and those who are in the hospital that were mentioned. God, we pray for the deacons, the deacon nominations. God, I call out to you and I ask the deacons that you would have served be the ones that are serving. God, I pray you would move in this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll stand and join us as we worship with more than conquerors, which comes right out of Romans chapter 8. is gone. You're the one who calls me on. You are the light. You are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. I will sing into the night Christ is risen and on high Greater is he living in me Than in the world No surrender, no retreat We are free Bye. 
our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. Nothing is impossible. of things and I'm glad to be back with everybody and glad to see some faces I haven't seen in months and things are going well but um, I know it can be a crazy time for everybody and an unsure time for everybody and uh, if you're like me you overthink it and try to figure out how can you fix it yourself and how you can handle everything but that's not what God calls us to do per se um, and maybe this morning that's you and maybe this morning you just need to let him handle it so just put it in his hands this morning and let him take control of whatever it is you're going through.
So this last song, when we added it to our list a couple of weeks ago, I went home and, or actually I was in the car and put it on my Spotify list and, and I listened to it and, yeah, you can keep playing, that's fine. It sounds good. Um, listen to it in the car. I'm driving down 301 and I start bawling. <laughs> this song is called Warm and it perfectly captures how I have been feeling for the past 120 plus days. How I feel like I've been sinking and couldn't find a way out. The course of this song says, let me see redemption win. It also says it on my shirt. If you missed that. Um, I did not plan that. But the first time I wore this shirt, Devon looked at me and said, guess what, buddy? It does. Redemption does win. So let's lift our voices and our hearts to a God who can see when we're tired, can see when we're feeling as low as we've ever felt before, and can still bring us through a victory in the end.
may be seated. Question in my mind at this point with just hearing that worship set that we serve a sovereign God that plans all things out and that he is here this morning and that he has a message for somebody and is trying to get somebody's attention. Let us pray. Father, as I come to you, and I come worn. I come weary. I come broken. I come leaning on the cross. I don't think anybody here can deny that the past couple of months have been hard. May I get through this? May I hide behind the cross? May I declare the words that you would have me to declare? May I decrease so much? May you increase. For those who come warned today, may they know that there is hope. Hope is a person. Hope is you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Since I've been the pastor here, I haven't talked a lot about my previous ministry at Tar Hill Baptist Church. God blessed in that ministry. It's a church in a small country town, population 117, and the God who sits at the center of the universe decided that for a season this church was going to experience revival, and to my knowledge they're still experiencing the waves of revival. We saw God do some amazing things things in our ministry there. Beyond anything I could have ever imagined. We grew from 80 to averaging at our highest 135, but we averaged off at 116. Think of that. A town population, 117, and on a typical Sunday morning, 116 people are in your worship center. To give the equivalent, it would be over 2,000 people being here every Sunday at Kenley Missionary Baptist Church. We weren't getting people from other churches. Those people who showed up at that congregation stayed two or three months, and then they went on their way most of the people we picked up while I was at Tar Hill Baptist Church were drug addicts, alcoholics, people that had been in domestic situations. It was not uncommon for the deacons of Tar Hill Baptist Church and myself to be out at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to find somebody. God blessed in that ministry. So much so that the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina picked up on it. I began to write articles for them. I began to travel the state for them. Honestly, I think that was part of the appeal for the committee. I can't speak for the committee, but for the committee as they looked at me, I was traveling everywhere from Boone to the coast. I was even invited to a place called Murphy. Yes, there is part of North Carolina that goes past Asheville. They did a video on us. They put it up at the Baptist State Convention, and 
I got to do a breakout session for all the Southern Baptist churches, 3,000 3, and some Baptist churches, 3,000 and some, whatever it is, number of Baptist churches across North Carolina. I got to do a breakout session, and it was all pretty cool. I, I don't tell you that story this morning to be bragging, even though, man, I'm bragging on God because he did a mighty work there. I give you that backstory to give you the story I'm about to give you. I, I was invited to go talk to a guy who was in desperate need of help. He was struggling in his church. And so they thought it would be great for me from a small town, small church to go talk to this other pastor about what God had been doing in my ministry at Tar Hill. I sat down with this pastor at the McDonald's in Gardner, where the V is at. You all probably know the exact McDonald's I'm talking about. I began my spiel about how God was moving at Tar Hill Baptist Church and how God could move in his church too. And I will never forget the words he said to me. I had never heard a pastor vocalize these words. Yes, I had encountered pastors who probably felt this way, but I'd never encountered a pastor who was brave enough to say it. Sitting there in that McDonald's that morning, that pastor said, I am hopeless. I am hopeless. I feel hopeless. I was arrogant. I was in my first church. You ever have those seasons where everything you just touch seems to turn into gold? Everything just seems to be another knock out of the park. You can't do anything wrong. I was arrogant. I was conceited. That pastor said, I am hopeless. And my words back to him were, go home, get on your knees, and call out to God for him to give you a vision statement. That pastor that day didn't need a vision statement. The pandemic has changed me. I couldn't help that guy that day because I had never been hopeless in ministry. told the elders, I'm not the same man I was before the pandemic. March 15th will be a day that I will never forget. Being truthful this morning, the past four months have been the hardest stretch of ministry I've ever had in 17 years of ministry. Do I believe God's blessed through it? Absolutely, because he's got a hold of this pastor. But I'm not going to lie to you. It's been difficult. I'd be lying to you if I stood up here and told you that I haven't thought on more than one occasion, probably more than I'd like to admit, about throwing in the towel and just giving up and walking away. And honestly, at times, Lowe's sounds like a great job. Just shooting it to you straight. I face spiritual warfare like I've never encountered before. Some of it, y'all know, some of you have been a part of, but what you don't know in the past four months is that evidently somewhere in the middle of this pandemic, because of stress, my immune system has decided to go down, which is not something you want to take place in the middle of a pandemic. 
and that I have fought with sinus infection after sinus infection, and I've never had a sinus infection since I've been moved up here to the point where the doctors quit giving me antibiotics and started putting me on steroids because they didn't want to give me more antibiotics. Right now, as I stand, I'm on another antibiotic facing a bacterial infection. Haven't had a problem with my heart in five years and a month ago on a Monday sitting in that office, my heart rate dropped down to 50 beats per minute and was irregular, and I was seeing a cardiologist the next morning. Now my heart's okay, don't panic. Not gonna drop dead. The doctor said he took care of it with the ablation. But I face spiritual warfare like I've never encountered before. None of that other stuff I just mentioned doesn't bother me as much as this is the longest stretch in my ministry I've ever had preaching the gospel where somebody hasn't come to Christ. I'm beginning to understand what Adoniram Judson may have felt when he went five years before he had his first convert. In the past four months, I can't tell you the number of nights that this pastor has not been able to sleep. That I've been up, agonizing, knowing that decisions that were about to come down we're going to hurt people in this congregation. But yet still feeling that God was calling us to go in that direction. I can't explain the weight that places on me. In the past four months, knowing that there were men and women who loved Jesus just as much as I loved Jesus, and they were praying just as hard to Jesus as I was praying hard to Jesus, and yet we were coming out with different outcomes and what direction we should be going. See, managing a church in a pandemic is hard. But on top of that, when you're hurting people you love, unintentionally. It weighs on you. I've had some tell me, just let it roll off. Let it roll off your back. I've had others tell me, don't let it affect you. But you can't be a shepherd and love your sheep. And when they're hurting, you're hurting. It doesn't work where you go home to your life. Just confessing, there are some pastors out there that can separate ministry from their life. I'm just not one of them. When somebody in my congregation is hurting, I am hurting. In the middle of this stretch, we've had people leave our church, and every time I've been broken over it. I share all of this because as a pastor this morning, I'm not coming up here as a superhero giving you a word. I'm coming up here this morning preaching a word that I myself need to hear. Because in the past four months, I have felt hopeless. See, I wish I could go back to younger me, the one who was meeting with that pastor at the, and Garner at the V, and tell a younger me not to be so arrogant and not to be so cocky because you've done nothing at Tar Heel Baptist Church. It's all been me. I wish I could go back and tell that younger me that this man needs some real help. You're about to walk in this meeting, and he doesn't need a vision statement for his church. What you as the pastor need to do is pick up your Bible, open it, and show him that he still has hope. And I'm just assuming this morning that God has orchestrated this because I didn't talk to Searching for Silas before they picked the first song this morning. But I'm assuming there are people here this morning 
that feel hopeless. Maybe it's because of a pandemic. Maybe it's because you have lost your job or you're about to lose your job or there is the chance you will lose your job. I saw this past week where RDU had laid off 750 people. Maybe you feel hopeless this morning because of a loved one. They died or maybe they've had a bad test result. In the middle of my hopelessness, what I have found is Jesus again. In the middle of my hopelessness, what I have found is the relationship that I have been longing for for so long. Now, if you're looking at me this morning, you're thinking, well, this makes me uncomfortable. I'm okay with that. You're looking at me this morning, you're saying, I can't relate. Let me just let you in on what I should have told younger me. If you live life long enough, you're going to feel hopeless at some point. I wish I could go back and tell younger me, and I, I would tell you if you have the attitude this morning, that often sometimes we forget how hopeless we were at times. Like I forgot how hopeless I felt when I had the heart procedure. I felt, I forgot how hopeless I was before I came to Jesus. So this message yet again is not for your neighbor. This message is for you. And before you all act all religious like the pastor has lost his mind, I'm in pretty good company. Might I remind you that David bouts stuff just like I'm talking about when the enemy was surrounding him. Might I remind you of Job, who sat there and lost everything. I think I've had it rough the past four months. At least I still have my family. And by the way, his friend showed up and told him to let it roll off his back. We're going to see today in Revelation chapter 5, where John feels hopeless. I'm not going to take long to go through this text. I've got one point. And my one point this morning is this. There is hope for the hopeless. Amen. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 says this. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on back sealed with the seven seals. Notice here that the God of the universe in Revelation chapter 5 verse 1 is sitting there and in his right hand. I love how descriptive the Bible is here. There leaves no room for error. In his right hand there is a scroll. Now scholars have debated and I don't have time and it would go off subject about what is written on that scroll and you can do your own research but I'm going to give you what I believe because I'm the one that God has appointed here to preach it this time. I believe what what is written on that scroll is the remainder of Revelation, Revelation 6 through 22. We see verses 2 through 4, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Here we see John, he's in heaven, a mighty angel calls out, I believe to be Gabriel, and Gabriel calls out with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? The scripture then tells us that there was a brief look all over heaven. Now keep in mind who is in heaven at this point. You had Abraham who God at one point looked up and said, look at the stars, Abraham. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And yet we find here in this text that Abraham was not worthy to open this scroll. Here, as there's a brief look over heaven, you have Moses that would have been there. Moses, the one who led the people that God appointed to lead the people out of Egypt and lead them to the verge of the promised land. And yet, 
Moses was not worthy enough to go up and take the scroll from God's right hand. You had David. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And yet David was not worthy to go up and to take this scroll. His son Solomon, the Bible says, was the wisest man to ever live. And yet the wisest man to ever live was not worthy enough to go up and take the scroll from the right hand of the Father. You had Elijah there. Elijah, who God decided to take up on chariots. And yet he was not worthy. At this gathering, you had old Peter. The one Jesus looked at and said, Peter, I will build the church on you. And he was not worthy. You had James. Certainly James. He pastored the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. He was the half-brother of Jesus. Certainly James would be worthy to go up and take this scroll. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, was given the great commission to go to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and, and tell them the gospel. And yet, Paul was not worthy to go and take this scroll. I, I believe at this gathering, you're going to have people like Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin, and for you Southern Baptists who are North Carolinians, Billy Graham. And none of them will be worthy to go up and to take the scroll. None were worthy. You picture the scene here, and the Scripture tells us in verse number 2, and verse number 3, and verse number 4, it tells us that, that John, who had followed Jesus in verse number 4, he says, I began to weep loudly. Not the crying you saw me doing on the front row as they were singing this last song silently. I'm talking like John is crying and all of heaven is watching him because he's ugly man crying. There is no shame in his game at this point. Why? Because John doesn't care who looks at him. He doesn't care what anybody thinks of him at this point. John feels hopeless. And maybe this morning you can relate to John. Because that's where you find yourself. Many days of late, that is where I have found myself. There's nothing like feeling hopeless in a situation, is there? You want to help. You want to do the right thing. You want to give answers, but really you have no answers to give. You have every right this morning if you feel hopeless. You look across our country as it turns upside down and you want to do something to fix it, but there's nothing really you can do to fix it and you feel hopeless. If you've got kids who are school-aged, trying to figure out what to do with those kids, whether it's going to be plan B and you send them into danger maybe, and they have to wear a mask all day long, or you keep them at home and you're not a teacher and you don't feel qualified to teach them, maybe you feel hopeless this morning. Maybe you've even had a dear friend pass away. 39 years old, this young man was. Worked at a nursing home. wasn't going to these COVID parties, wasn't trying to catch it, was just trying to provide for his family. Grew up on a, he found out on a Monday he had it. Went to the hospital on a Saturday. And the next Monday morning, my dear friend passed away. 39 years Old. Left behind four kids. The oldest being 15, and he now is positive for this deadly virus. Maybe you know somebody. 
and you feel hopeless. Look at verse 5, because that's where John's at. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. You may want to underline that. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Here it tells us in verse 5, you have John here in verse 4, a man, ugly man crying, weeping, feeling hopeless. And then one of the redeemed, some have speculated that maybe this is even Moses. I, we don't know who it is. It could be one of you for all I know. They're going to look over at John, see him ugly man crying, and they're going to look at him and say, weep no more. Weep no more, John. That's the word I need today. Weep no more. And I'm assuming that that's probably the word some of you need today. Weep no more. And in other words, in your situation that you feel hopeless in, don't feel hopeless. This is the message that I should have looked at that young man who was pastoring in a church in this area and looked at him and said, weep no more. See, the same hope that was found in heaven that day is the same hope that you and I have today in our situation. Let me say that again. The hope that was found in heaven that day is the same hope that you and I have in our situation today, whatever that situation may be. What is the hope that you and I have? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. That word conquered is actually the word Nike in the original language. It means victorious. If you have the New King James Version and you look there, what it's going to say is that the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. If you have the New Living Translation, it's going to say that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has won victory. If you have the NIV, it's going to say that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. What are we talking about here? Well, dear sir, dear ma'am, what we are talking about is 2,000 years ago, the very Son of God left heaven, came to earth, and died on a cross for our sins and walked out and conquered death and conquered sin. So whatever we are facing, if we have called on the name of the Lord, we can declare victory. And in victory, there is always hope. Verse 6, And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. I don't have time to go into that this morning, but when you read those verses right there, what you have is a description of a triune God. You have a description of the Trinity. We talked about last week the number seven means completion. We see here it says seven horns. That is a complete. What are the horns? It means all-powerful. Who is all-powerful but God? It talks about here the Lamb, which is Jesus. It talks about here the seven spirits, a complete spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. Right here in the book of Revelation, you have a description of the Trinity. Verse 7, And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Who was worthy to go to the God of the universe and take this scroll? It was the lion of the tribe of Judah. It was the root of David. It is who is our hope. Notice here how this person is described in verse 6. Among the elders I saw a... Lamb. That's not what I'm expecting. When I think of hope, I, I don't think of a lamb. I would have imagined they would have described here a lion. Maybe even a cheetah. 
I would not picture them describing here, John describing seeing a lamb. And if you go to the original language, it's not even a tough like UNC Chapel Hill ram. What is being described here is a pet lamb. One that stumbles, one that falls, one that follows behind you. Maybe one that I picture because my son is taking piano lessons that Mary had. But we must remember that lambs are important in redemptive history. You have the sacrificial lamb. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, it says, God provided for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. My son, Abraham said this. Remember, God called Abraham to give up the thing that he loved most, and Abraham walked three days knowing that he was going to have to sacrifice his son. And as he was going up to the top of the same mountain, I believe that Jesus Christ would later be crucified on. His son said, Daddy, I see the kindling. I, I see the fire starter. Where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. We have the sacrificial lamb, but we also have the, the Passover lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You remember the Passover lamb and the purpose of it, right? They were in bondage and God was trying to deliver them from Egypt. And God says, I want you to put over your, your house the, the blood of the lamb so that I will pass by you. We have here the sacrificial lamb. We have the Passover lamb. Lambs are important. Notice that this little old lamb is described as being slain. See, what is being described here, dear sir? What is being described here, dear ma'am? What is being described here, dear teenager? What is being told to us is that our hope is not found in an elephant that our hope is not found in a donkey. That our hope, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, our hope is found in the Lamb. This Lamb that is standing here is none other than Jesus Christ. He has been slain. He went to the cross in my place and in your place for your sins and my sins, the things we have thought, said, and done. He died in my place. He died in your place. And three days later, according to the inerrant, infallible word of God that God himself breathed out, Jesus Christ come walking out of that grave conquering. And so you and I who may come in here and feel hopeless today, we have hope. Why do we have hope? Because the lamb that was slain is alive. He is at the right hand of the Father. We have hope. I picture the scene that is being described here in Revelation chapter 5, and I find hope. I find hope. God the Father sitting at the center of the universe is holding a scroll that describes Revelation chapter 6 through 22. John starts crying out as the redeemed are gathered around him in his hopelessness. Someone looks at John and says, Weep no more. And then one steps forward and is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah, which is prophecy. The root of David, which is prophecy. A lamb who had been slain, Jesus Christ, and he takes hold of the scroll. Which tells me something, dear sir, dear ma'am, dear teenager. Whatever you're going through, Jesus Christ can take hold of it and conquer it in a minute. Now let's look at the scene of your life. You've got the bad test result. You're in the 7 to 14 day window waiting to see whether you've got this virus or not. You don't know what to do with your children this year. You feel like they're going to lose either way. 
you've lost your job or you're about to lose your job. You feel hopeless. You may not even know what to pray. And that's okay because I've been there too, but the Bible reassures me that when I called on the name of the Lord, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt me and that when I don't know what to pray, He prays on my behalf. And we learned last week that the Holy Spirit that lives within us is also in the throne room of God and He's got an ear to the Father through the Son. And maybe that's where you're at today. Do not fear. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb who was slain, is alive. And if he is alive, there is hope. Notice here, notice how heaven responds to the hope they have in Jesus. They're not panicked. Heaven is not worried. Not even with this pandemic and what is coming in the future is heaven worried at this point. Notice how heaven responds. They, they break out in a worship service. We're not talking a Southern Baptist worship service in the South where it's be still and know that I am God. What I find here in Revelation chapter 5 probably aligns more with my Pentecostal brothers and sisters where they're getting down for Jesus. Notice how they respond in heaven. Corey Tin Boone, maybe you've never heard of this lady. I encourage you, go home and watch her biography or read her biography. Corey Tin Boone was a lady that was a non Jew during Nazi Germany. They overtook the area where she was located at, and she was a devout Christ follower, and so she began to hide Jews in her house her and her sister, and they were eventually caught with her father. While in concentration camps, her sister passed away, her father passed away. I could not imagine what Corey Tim Moon went through. The only reason she got out of the concentration camp was because of a clerical error. But I, she has a word. A word that honestly is a quote that I have put to memory. And if you feel hopeless, I would encourage you to put it to memory. Here's what Corey Ten Boone says. There is no panic in heaven. There is only praise. There is no panic in heaven. There is only praise. There is no panic in heaven going on right now because there is a pandemic in America. There is only praise. There is no concern, no panic in heaven worried about who's going to win the next election. There is only praise. Verse 8 tells us the four living creatures, that is the cherubim and the seraphim. Let's look at this. It says, And when he had taken the scroll and the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Notice here that in response to Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, taking the scroll, notice how the redeemed respond. They grab their worship instruments. They grab their drums. They grab their keyboards, they grab their bass guitars, they grab their tambourines, and they begin to worship Jesus Christ. Notice here, they begin to sing. The Bible tells us that here, notice also that they also have golden bowls of full of incense while they are singing. And it tells us in verse number eight, we don't have to wonder what these golden bowls are. These golden bowls are the prayers of the redeemed. Some of you this morning, you've come in and you've wondered, because I've wondered myself in the past four months, are my prayers? prayers and the prayers that I'm calling out, the prayers as tears are running down my eyes, are they even getting beyond the ceiling? Have you wondered it? <laughs> Revelation chapter 5 tells me I don't have to wonder that as a redeemed, a child of the king, when I call out to God, they are thrown before him in worship, meaning that the God of heaven hears my prayers. Let me let you in on something, dear sir. The God of heaven hears your prayers. 
And there is no more powerful weapon on this earth than the prayers of a desperate saint. I can't move mountains, but I know the one who can. So I call out to him, Daddy! I can't fix this pandemic. Oh, but I know the one who can. Daddy! I, I don't, oh man, let me tell you, woo! I don't know the one who can fix this church, but I know the one who can. Daddy! I don't know the one who can fix your problem. I don't know how I can fix your problem, but I know the one who can. Daddy. Daddy, will you come to my rescue? Daddy, will you move in this situation that seems immovable? Haba! I was watching NCIS one night. If you think that's wrong, just start praying for me. And I will never forget when Ziva's daddy died. She plays this Jewish character, and she didn't cry out, Daddy! She cried out, Abba! And I was thinking, oh, that's what it sounded like maybe when Jesus cried out just a little from the cross. Abba! Listen, I can't fix your problems, but I know the one who can. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. The lamb who was slain. It, it tells us here that the rapture church sang a new song. You know they're worshiping. And you know they got to be in the presence of Jesus when you get a bunch of Christ followers worshiping to a new song they've never heard before. They're singing a new song. In my younger days, I, I, I used to think that maybe that was Bill Gaither, and as I've got matured, I, I've grown to believe that maybe it's Lecrae, and God's got a funny, funny sense of humor, and that some of you who don't like rap, that's going to be the new song y'all singing in heaven. Notice the song they sang. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, singing with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Notice that the redeemed, when they realize they are in the presence of the king, they start singing. But not only do they sing, the angels say, Man, we want to get in on this too. And so thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels are going to start calling out and worshiping God, Jesus Christ. I picture it maybe like when the angel showed up there and Jesus was being pronounced he was coming to the shepherds when it says that thousands upon thousands of angels were calling out. I picture that's the song that is taking place. And what are they singing? Oh, they're singing not some just a love song that could be about Jesus or your boyfriend. No, they're singing about the lamb. It's just worthy What is the lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then we see verses 13 and 14 and it says, As I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and they worshipped oh church do you listen do you see what's taking place in this worship service I don't know about you but I want to be a part of that I mean, you've got the redeemed singing a song. You've got the angel singing a song. And, and when I was a music director and we would do a cantata, they would always save a fast, upbeat grand finale for the last song. Listen, what we have described there in verses 13 and 14 is a grand finale. It tells us that all creation, the angels and all of the redeemed are going to cry out together, singing in one loud voice to the one who was and is and is to come. I don't know about you, but that brings me comfort today. That brings me hope. It tells me here that the four living creatures at that point say, Amen. Oh, they were Southern Baptists at that point. Amen. That is right, they cry out. The, four, the elders then at that point, they fall down. They worship Him. Why? Because Jesus Christ is on the scene. And when Jesus Christ is on the scene, there is hope. 
Oh, listen, I don't know what you're facing today, but I know who holds tomorrow. It is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb, the second part of the Trinity, the son, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the bomb of Gilead, the prince of peace, the great I am. He is none other than Jesus Christ. So let me ask, maybe you entered this worship service this morning and you feel hopeless. And you've never invited Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You want hope? There's hope. And whether you're watching online or you're in this room, I want you to walk away knowing that whatever you're facing, there is hope. His name is Jesus. And so maybe right where you're at, you need to call on the name of the Lord. You need to admit that you're a sinner, that you have thought things, said things, and done things that God the Father hates. Don't feel like you're alone. I'm a sinner too. You need to admit that you deserve a devil's hell. That's not far-fetched. This pastor deserves a devil's hell. Let me just let you in on something. Everybody else in this room deserves a devil's hell. And then you cling to the cross because he has conquered. And maybe that's the step you need to take this morning. If that's you, I'm going to encourage you to fill out a yellow card if you're here. See me after the service. I'm here. You're on mine, or you don't feel comfortable with either one of those, you can email me, pastor at kinleybaptist.com, and I'll be happy to talk to you and lead you to Christ through email. Maybe you don't feel comfortable with that. That's okay. Here's my cell phone number, 910-916-0525. You can text me. You can call me. I just want to talk to you about Jesus. And maybe that's how you need to respond this morning because you ain't going to have hope until you have Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're tuning in online and if you would just put the facade down because we're good at that, right? Walking in the church, smiling like everything's okay. I'm the pastor. I do it a lot of times, but I'm here today telling you I've come in today struggling. And maybe you're where I have been and where I am still on some days. Would you just call out to God? God, I feel hopeless. God, I'm learning I can't control anything. God, I've shed tears. I've called the professionals. I've read books. God, I've, I've done everything I possibly can. And God, I'm in a situation where only you can move. Maybe that's the prayer you need to pray right now. God, I just need you. I need the lion of the tribe of Judah. I need the root of David. God, I need you. And maybe that's where you start today. Being I've been so honest, I've prayed that prayer so many times. Even this morning when I woke up, That was the prayer of my heart. God, I need you to move. God, I know where you're calling us to go, and God, I can't get us there. God, I I need you to do it. God, I need my heart softened. I need others' hearts softened. God, we don't need expert wisdom. We've got plenty of that. God, we need you. Maybe that's the prayer you need to pray. But I hope you don't stay there.
If that's all you've walked away from my message, you've missed the whole point. There's hope for the hopeless. And when you realize you have hope, and that, as Corey Tim Boone says, there is no panic in heaven, there is only praise. It should lead you to call out and praise Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to end a little bit differently. We're going to end singing praises to Jesus because I believe that's what Jesus would have us to do. It's a song that I have burned out in my car over the past four months. I love Southern rock, so I love some David Crowder. And this song has spoke to me again and again and again. And so would you offer this song up as your worship? All my hope is in Jesus. Would you stand? tribe of Judah, the root of David, Jesus Christ. Go be light and salt in a world.